Okay, so you may be wondering why Cal OES is sitting here in the middle of a football stadium. We're here at Qualcomm, and we're talking to Dr. Jim Dunford. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. I really appreciate it. And the reason we're talking to you today is because you were the um, incident commander for the medical team here. Uh, is, that, is that the right way to put it? Why don't you put it in better words for me? Yeah, that's, I think that's a good way to put it. Okay. Yep. And yep. your current role, uh, you are the city's medical director here in San right. Diego. Yep. Since 1997, I've overseen the fire department and paramedic program in the city. Great. So things were a little bit different back then in 2007 during the fire siege. Um, there weren't any evacuees here on the inside part of the stadium. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, Th this was absolutely empty. There was nobody here. Everything actually occurred outside, um, starting in the parking lot and then coming inside uh, within the enclosed spaces uh, where we actually even had uh, a small hospital of almost 350 people. Well, let's talk about that. How did you or what, how did that come to be? You know, to a certain extent, we have to go back to 2003 and realize that we'd actually gone through a drill in 2003 with wildfires where Qualcomm actually had become a place of refuge for a lot of people. And in 2007, again, that's, that same thing started to, to uh, roll with the early uh, evacuation of nursing home patients being directed toward Qualcomm. Um, so by the time I got here in the middle of the afternoon, there were actually several large busloads of individuals that had arrived and were actually beginning to assemble themselves on the plaza level uh, where uh, they had actually taken up residence and uh, you know people were putting out cots people were in, in wheelchairs and there was a semblance of actually the beginning of um, individual rooms that were being dedicated to particular nursing homes that had already arrived so your main concern then at this particular point was making sure that these these elderly folks, these senior citizens who had come from these nursing homes, had right. their health care needs met. Exactly. I mean, the, this was a, an assortment of people, some of whom really uh, went so far as to have dementia, didn't really know what their medical problems were. We were certain that uh, among this population, we were having people who were going to be needing evening doses. Could have been uh, anti-epileptic uh, medicines, diabetes medicines hypertensive medicines, but a lot of people didn't know what medications they were even on. And on top of that, we had a group of people that were out in the, um, you know, in the, on the grounds that were, had brought themselves here who also had medical needs uh, that were going to need to be attended to. So it was a combination of trying to provide maintenance care for a large group of elderly people and then some of the acute needs of people who might, for example, have asthma and have forgotten their inhalers or some of the other kind of things that would, you know, naturally pop up at any large scale event. So besides the, the nursing home folks, what were some of the other medical needs that need to be met back then? Uh, well, and again, I think one of the important things is to remember is that we weren't really trying to replicate an emergency department here. Um, some of the volunteers early on when they got to the stadium thought that that was what we were really intent on building was a sort of a way station because as if the hospitals had already reached their capacity and that wasn't the case at all. I, I work at UC San Diego emergency department and I have great contacts with my colleagues there and all the other ERs in town and the, all the ERs were wide open so the last thing our stadium needed to do was to try to stand up an emergency department so our, our one of our early priorities is use the 911 system and get people out of here if they really have emergencies. So we created a sort of a stabilization and transport for those handful of people that had an emergency pop up. Um, and we weren't really trying to keep them here for any length of time. So it became uh, important really to understand that principle and then design the incident command system around more of a, a, a process that would stabilize and transport emergencies if they actually arose not encourage emergencies to come here by not advertising to the community. We weren't really trying to replace an ER and then really sort of setting about to find out what's the matter with all these older people here and what medications are they going to need um, as soon as possible. So what was what was going on out there with regard to the fires and then the subsequent evacuations? Was the event that was happening out there affecting their mental capacity here? Uh, well, you did know, you see that? Uh, we, we did. It. We actually had uh, a couple of psychiatrists available for people who had had acute stress reactions. Ah, yes. um, it wasn't the majority of the patients, though. I mean, we had a very well-behaved uh, group of people yeah. that were actually very calm, and I think that was part of the attitude was to make sure that people didn't feel that there was a sense of urgency. There was naturally smoke in the air. That was not too good for people who had asthma or emphysema. 
But for the most part, what we were seeing were people who had been displaced, who were afraid and upset and out of the medicines that they really needed to take. And so among the earliest things we had to do was to kind of create a pharmacy response. Luckily, the local pharmacies jumped into the equation. We had a pharmacist here from one of our hospitals who took a lead on that. And before you knew it, we actually had CVS and some of the other local pharmacies that were extremely willing to be able to service directly to Qualcomm Stadium for all of these patients and their needs. We actually got a, a rapid turnaround. Somebody purchased us a printer fax machine so we could actually fax prescriptions. We established a pharmacy that was right on one of the bars upstairs. Mm. Uh, a bunch of pharmacists came in, doctors started writing prescriptions, and before you knew it, we were writing Parkinson's drugs, heart failure medicines, diabetes, wow. and even for people who really had you know, cancer pain, uh, we were writing narcotics. Wow. So it was pretty amazing, mm -hmm. and it was all being delivered to Qualcomm. Some of the pharmacies actually said that they would you know, provide up to seven days worth of free medications just free. to kind of get people through. Yeah. So there was this fantastic sort of community-based response to the medical needs of the people that were actually having to be sheltered here. What did that do for you and, and you know, your, your pride in your city, your town, your county? Well, the way that everybody came together like that, free medications for a week. Yeah, well, the whole event actually was pretty inspiring. And, you know, we, we were very fortunate that we, that we had good national television coverage. And I think we deserved to actually have good national TV because there was a sense of what happened in the stadium that in the face of something really tragic and, and horrible that San Diego had actually been able to put something together pretty special. Uh, and we didn't really want to compare ourselves to what happened in Katrina in New Orleans, but the facts spoke for themselves is that, you know, for whatever reason, it had worked out really well in San Diego, and, and not, too, not too long before that, it hadn't been quite so favorable in New Orleans. Uh, you know, we had, we had the weather uh, work to our advantage. I mean, this is an outside stadium. Yeah. The wind had to be blowing the right direction. Luckily, the smoke was going a different direction. If we were completely shrouded in, you know, in soot, it would have been a different thing. But we were lucky in that respect. Uh, it was it was relatively mild conditions, so that people could sleep out. Uh, you know, we weren't in uh, 10 degrees zero yeah. uh, or kind of conditions. Did you have contingency plans that if, in fact, the wind shifted and brought that smoke this way, uh, were there? You know, was there a plan B for these folks who had problems with their, you know, breathing anyway? Uh, well, the no? answer is no. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there was a separate facility up in Del Mar, you know, at the racetrack. Yeah. So there was another countywide large scale uh, event uh, where people were encouraged to go, not just the horses, but the people themselves went there. And in fact, uh, the Cal Matt uh, disaster team was actually deployed to the Del Mar fairgrounds to actually help them because we had plenty of of what we needed here from a healthcare point of view. Uh, we had pharmacists, we had my team of guys, emergency medicine physicians from UCSD that were working 12 hour shifts and we had lots and lots of you know support staff. In fact, you have too many. The, the problem a lot of times in something like this is you have too many volunteers. Oh, okay. Managing them is a challenge when you get to be such a, a big staff, right? You, I mean, you, you, you can take care of a lot of people with a relatively small number of people one of the biggest challenges we had and we, we learned in retrospect was that we actually had somebody who wasn't who they said they were. Really? Yeah, How does that happen? Had a, yeah, it came out in the news about a week after one of our best nurses turned out not to be a nurse. And she had volunteered here and had done a very able job and it turned out that, she, her, that all of her credentials were fictitious. Wow. Yeah. And so vetting people in a disaster is actually something that you actually have to think a lot about. Uh, and the way it worked was you know, by the time I got here, I, shortly after the fires were, the determination was made people are going to be coming here, all the doors of the stadium were still open. And you have to start from the beginning, close all the doors, create one incident command, and you would like to know that everybody who comes in and says that I'm a firefighter or I'm a physician or I'm a nurse, that you could scan something and you'd be able to prove it on the spot. That, that doesn't happen mm. in a disaster. Mm. And I think it's an important thing to, for, for anybody who's involved in these large scale incidents is to realize at some point and as rapidly as possible, you really do have to create some sort of credentialing process and allow them, the people that belong here to stay and the people that don't. Because we found people that literally went down to Army Navy surplus and bought gear that made them look like people they weren't. Firefighter outfits on individuals that were not firefighters and people who said that they were physicians and nurses who weren't. So these people were just folks who wanted to participate, 
wanted to help, or did they have ulterior motives here? I didn't see anything ultimately malicious, but you can actually, you have to take into account the possibility that that could happen, right? Yeah. yeah. So God knows why somebody says they are who they are when they're not. I don't know. Uh, this one particular person, it turned out to be, you know, quite newsworthy for, for a week or two that she actually did a great job. But when the newspaper called me up and said, hey, do you remember so-and-so? I said, yeah, she's wonderful. I said, well, th what would you think if I told you she wasn't a nurse? So that's how you found out? Yeah. Yeah, that's how I found out. Did you pick your jaw up off the floor? <laughs> <laughs> they got a little Bluetooth in my headphones, so I think maybe my head hit the steering wheel. Oh, no. <laughs> they should have asked you to pull over first <laughs> before telling you that information, right? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, but that, 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 was, a, that was one of the lessons that we've learned, and I think when you're really going through this kind of thing, you, you rely on your close friends. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we operate here uh, every time the, 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 uh, the Chargers play. So, you know, the, the nice thing about this is that the fire department integrates every weekend in this stadium one way or another. If they have special events, if there are truck pulls or any other kind of thing, there's always a presence of fire EMS sitting up there in the incident command of whatever's going on. So for us to kind of turn on the lights, if you will, and say, now we're going to host a disaster here, it's not that different. I think that was the important thing is that the fire department knows this stadium backwards. We've, we've run two Super Bowls in this stadium. Mm -hmm. So if you think preparations for an event are, you know, are key, well, try running a Super Bowl. So we know the ins and outs of this place. We know where we put our teams. And it really wasn't that much different, honestly, to be able to say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna set up a, a scenario at the stadium and we're gonna actually run something there. Mm -hmm. Where did you guys actually hole up? Did you have a main office in here somewhere? or? Well, on the plaza level, yeah, there's actually a very nice level over in the plaza section where there, there are bars where you normally would get your carved you know, meat stations and you'd pick up your, your custom beers. Uh, and that was turned into a, one of the large areas where there were a lot of inside elderly people. And as you go down that hallway, there are at least two or three more areas, all of which have you know public bathrooms and then where there were areas that were made private so that you could actually take care of the, the kind of problems that you really encounter, which are not so much emergent as nursing home problems. Mm -hmm. But all you got to, if you wanted to take out a stadium, you have to, all you have to do is flush a, uh, you know, a uh, diaper down a toilet. Oh, And I'm wow. not kidding. I mean, one of the most critical infrastructural elements of a stadium during one of these large scale incidents is the sewer system. Mm -hmm. And so it was imperative that none of the elderly people would flush something down the toilet that wasn't supposed to go down there. When we got a lot of medical equipment sent in here from the state, they sent us equipment that, frankly, we didn't need. Uh, we weren't really preparing ourselves to stand up a freestanding emergency room for a week or two because all the hospitals in San Diego had been taken out. To the contrary, all the hospitals were open and running. What we really needed were basic elementary sanitary supplies and the things that you would need if you were going to try to prevent an outbreak, mm. right? You don't want to have a cruise ship diarrheal incident in the middle of 350 or 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was that type of simple stuff, lave las manos. You know, we were washing our hands, reminding people of the way that they were doing things and to be particularly careful about just routine sanitary things, mo um, assuring privacy, showering, avoiding falls and a lot of the things that nursing homes normally pay a lot of attention to. In the wake of all that, of course, we also learned a lot of lessons about having tran uh, transportable medical records. So we had no re medical records on the majority of our patients. The nursing homes in San Diego didn't have electronic records and in, in subsequent to that we've created a lot better systems that if this happens again that the nursing homes will have means by which they can transmit the electronic health records and make sure we know the medicines uh, we have much uh, more robust availability of of other nursing homes in the community that might be able to accept patients um, so that maybe people wouldn't have to go to a stadium again it's a big stadium how did you communicate with all your staff well, you know, we ran it very much like ICS, the incident command system, almost like HICS, like the hospital incident command system. So we had a medical director, we had meetings and appointment times, we had individuals who were, had designated positions, and then we basically had runners. And so at the top of the stadium was where police and the, you know, the overall logistics uh, incident commanders uh, operated, then the medical team just reported for the meetings mm -hmm. periodically mm -hmm. like 
like we were supposed to. Yeah. And they came down and visited us. It sounds to me planning was key to all this. I mean, planning, but then adapting yeah. to the environment. Right. Um, well, for those of us that had gone on incidents, uh, you know, whether you went to her yeah. Katrina or you went to Hurricane Rita, or if you're part of a disaster medical assistance team or an urban search and rescue team, and you know something about the architecture of, of you know, of preparedness, mm. um, it's pretty easy to slip in there. And then that's really what you need. Or you need the cards that tell you what to do. Um, and you need the vests that tell you what your job uh, responsibility is. So I think with a, with a basic understanding of how an incident command structure works, understanding how the fire department is so essential to kind of establishing those sorts of things, what role law enforcement has to place, um, play in it. It, it, you know, it, it falls together fairly easily, but, but that's because I'm an emergency physician and I've spent my life in emergency medicine and I'm an EMS specialist. So these large incident uh, should be run by you know people who have that same kind of background and expertise it, it's great to have volunteers who want to come in and help but there are people you know in every city in the united states that know exactly how to do this um, all the big cities in the u.s uh, their medical directors are all friends with me we all we all know each other and whenever these incidents happen we're comparing notes we have a bulla there yes. then i call them up and i want to know how i'm how i'm going to handle that and and it, it just it, it, these, this is this is the way this goes now. Right. I could listen to this all day, but the last question I have to ask you, I think, at this point, is if there was any one or two pieces of advice, wisdom, some things that you have learned from this 2007 incident, mm -hmm. uh, what would you pass on to folks who might be in your position, in another town, another city, another state? Well, I think. You know, it, it's important to know that these large, uh, large uh, scale facilities can suddenly be turned into facilities that uh, operate for a totally different reason like this, and that you have to be familiar with the people that are actually running them. I mean, who, it, it's a responsibility of EMS physicians to get to know their community very well. And uh, I'm not telling anything to anybody that's in this business that I am th that they probably don't already know. but. It, the old adage of you don't want to exchange business cards with key stakeholders during a disaster is really true. So uh, for me, knowing the, having worked previously with the police department, working very every day with the fire department, understanding the hospital system, uh, understanding the emergency response, the helicopters, and all the things that kind of go into this type of thing, it becomes sort of a se second nature. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think it's just, you know, drilling and uh, and then, and then listening to what other people, because there were a lot of people who actually knew an awful lot about it. I just knew the medicine part. All right, Dr. Jim Dunford, thank you so much for joining us here at the, the home of the San Diego Chargers. Go Chargers.